most people I know don't really sit down and say, let me see how I can get away with something. At least that's most people. Now some people really do sit down and go, hey, well it says here, and it says here, so I'll bet I can go here, and then I can do this, because that said that, I can come back over here, and if I get this over here, well then I can do that. No, they don't sit down and actually do that. But how they go about their life and living it sometimes is the same thing. They convince themselves of something or they hear something that sounds good and so they run after it, pursuing it to find something to prove that they can get away with doing what it is they think they can do. Now, sadly, what we're talking about is Christian living. We're talking about living by grace. We're talking about grace that's been given to each and every one of us as a free gift from God. The ability of God to forgive man his sins. But there's more to it than that. And that's where people tend to get this idea of cheap grace, expensive grace, and some kind of grace that God never called one way or the other. They want to take grace and disassociate it from God. They want to say, God, you're not the one who gives it to me. I get it because of Jesus Christ. You don't bestow it. I get it because Jesus died. I automatically can have forgiveness of sins and everything else that goes with it and go to heaven because Jesus died. And so they take grace and they literally almost spit on the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins by eliminating the Father from the picture. Other people tend to need more grace. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And the Bible says so. Because they have this condemnation from the enemy that they constantly feel as though they're not good enough or worthy enough to even lift their eyes towards heaven and ask God to forgive them. So grace is extended to them in a very real way that abounds much more to them than it does to those who choose to abuse grace as has been given by God. This question of grace often confuses people because they assume that you have to do something to get it. And quite frankly, no, you don't. God is the one who chooses to exercise his sovereign right as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the creator of the universe, to do anything he wants to. If he wants to just wipe out the entire slate, clean out, as he said to Moses, I'll just wipe out all the people and we'll start over with you. He can do it. And, quite frankly, get away with it. He's gone. Fortunately, He's also reasonable in some ways, beyond our understanding, but Moses could sit down and talk to him and say, look, you don't want to do that because, you know, it's look bad for the other people. You know, it's look bad doing this and, you know, he negotiated with God. Kind of like probably made God smile. Because that may have been what God intended all along was to see if Moses would intercede and actually lay down his life for the children of Israel. Because if Moses had not said, blot my name out of the book of life. The children of Israel were toast and we wouldn't have Jews today. Oh, maybe God might have started with Moses and began all over again. You see, God doesn't have a problem wiping out every single living human being off the face of the planet Earth right now and doing it again. You know, starting over, having recreation in the beginning with God. And he could do it. And you'd never know the difference. And eternity would never question or quantify or qualify God doing it. Because God is sovereign. So he's the one who is the actual beneficent benefactor that's giving us grace. It's not something you earn. It's not something that you can attain to by accepting Jesus' sacrifice for sin. It's something that God gives freely of his own choice because he loves. And because he is love, Grace is that 
ability of his to put into action and demonstration the very fact that he is love. And that's what grace is. It is the action of love manifested towards mankind who cannot redeem himself or protect himself or even justify himself in the sight of a holy living God who is sinless and we are sinful. The reality would be something like this stick trying to walk through fire. It won't happen. It's kind of like sticking this stick in a raging inferno. It will get consumed. You are, quite frankly, a stick figure. And unless you do something about it, when you're in the presence of God as a raging inferno or as a consuming fire, His holiness, poof, you're toast. So grace was given so that you could begin to develop a relationship with God our Father. Because without grace, you could not even have approached God. You would have been consumed like those sticks. The fire of God's holiness would have poof, toasted you in the reality of it being in a dimension where you could not exist. You would not survive very long in the very same place where God exists. Because you don't have the ability to purify yourself. Even as we're told that John had to have the coal removed from the altar and, you know, to cleanse his lips. That many of the prophets, when you hear of these visions of heaven or whatever, likewise had to be cleansed in some way. But God has extended his scepter of righteousness to us in the form of his son by allowing us to come into heaven and appropriating grace by his deeming us acceptable to receive it. So there is a controlling factor of grace. And sometimes when I read this and I share these words that Chuck Smith wrote when it's uh, Why Grace Changes Everything, I like to add that little extra part that, remember, even though we are given it, God controls it. God can still do what he wants to do. So acceptance of grace is a wonderful thing because by grace are you saved and that not of yourself. But recognize who's giving it, who extends it, and who is the arbitrator of grace. Because unless you do, you'll abuse grace to the point where God himself will remove you from his face. And then grace will mean nothing for you because you'll wind up in hell instead of heaven where he wants you to be. The gospel of grace is that each one of us can relate to God even though we are far from perfect. We can still have a beautiful relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. When we relate to the Father by faith through His Son, we have a solid relationship. We are now sons of God. Because He is our Father, we don't have to wonder if we are worthy to come to Him. We do not come on the basis of our worthiness but on the basis of our relationship with Him. That is what the Gospel of Grace is all about, our relationship with Him. God looks at us as though we had never committed a single trespass against Him. Now, I may have trouble looking at myself that way, and I look at myself in the mirror and say, Chuck, you're a sinner. You can't control your appetite, you have so many flaws. And yet God looks at me and says, forgive Him. He loves me and accepts me as I am because I am in Jesus Christ. In Jesus. He who has the Son hath life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. We're warned in Scripture about those who would abuse grace because it says they went out from us as though they were with us, but since they had gone from us, they never were with us in the beginning. Jesus kind of hints at that when he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Though they cast out demons in his name, though they did marvelous works, their heart and their attitude, their functioning realities was not a relationship with Jesus, but was to do iniquity. To be, as it were, those ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. 
they had never given their life over completely to the Lordship of God. He loves me and accepts me as I am because I am in Jesus. Even as he has accepted his own son, so now he accepts me. Paul tells us that we have been accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians 1.6 The Beloved One is Jesus, and you being in Jesus are accepted by God just as Jesus is accepted. That is why the Gospel of Grace is the best news I ever heard. God forgives us because we believe in His Son, whom He sent to die for our sins. All our sins have been blotted out. There is no accounting of guilt. As Paul says, Oh, how happy are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Oh, how happy is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. Romans 6, 7 and 8. As sons of God, which we are in Jesus, if we are in Jesus, we have every right to come to our Father to ask Him for anything that we might need. We have every right to trust the wisdom of our Father to either grant or deny that request according to His knowledge of what is best for us. We can commit ourselves to our Heavenly Father who loves us so very much, He will give us only what is best and what we need for our life. What a joy it is to know that God desires to bestow upon us the riches and the fullness of His love, not because we deserve it, but because He loves us. This is the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ that God himself said in the form of his Son that this is eternal life, that they should know me, Father, and know him who sent me, you. And that is what grace is all about, knowing and having a continuing, ongoing relationship with Jesus, because we must be in him in order to have grace. But once we are in him, we have that relationship with Jesus, whom he said that as we are in him, then we are in the Father also. If we wanted to see the Father, we could look at Jesus, because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. But he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. In all of these things of grace, it behooves us then to develop our relationship continually daily with Jesus himself in the reality of knowing that if we are in the Son, like First John said, then we have eternal life. But if we are not in the Son, then we lose it all. Grace, forgiveness, mercy, love. We must be in the Son. So, grace is about being in right relationship with God. Right relationship with God can only be established one way, through faith in Jesus through asking Jesus into our life, through knowing that Jesus loves us and has accepted us. Because he said, any man that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So we have to turn our eyes and our hearts. We have to turn our wills and our attitudes and actions to Jesus. We have to ask him to take control of our life. We have to implore that he develop a personal relationship with us in a way that we can understand so that we can relate to him one to one on an ongoing basis so we will have enjoyable to us that relationship with the Father that he promised we can have through himself, through his spirit, and through the ability of grace to change us in ways that we never would have dreamed imagined. If we were living by law, of course we would not. But since we're living by grace and we've been given grace, and grace has been extended to us, then ought not we also to give grace to one another? Grace for grace, mercy for mercy, forgiving one another even as we've been forgiven. Let grace guide you, because whatever you're given, you should, though you may not, you should give away. Because as you'll do, you'll find that the proof of who you are in Jesus is determined by how you reflect Him to others.